For hundreds of years, we have bowed to the objectivity of science, but have cherished subjectivity and religion in our living. We have allowed our lives to become a set of dichotomies. Can we now invite science to help integrate our ways of living and revolutionize our religions? Can we insist that our subjective experiences and spiritual philosophy be actually allowed to extend our science? 64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Welcome to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. My name is Igor S.F. Walker. Today, we look at the self-aware universe. How consciousness creates the material world by Amit Goswami. So, how about you slow down and relax? Reduce all that noise for just a bit. Make that choice and decide to listen. In this video, we explore a title that shatters the wildly popular belief held by Western science that matter is the primary stuff of creation and proposes instead that consciousness is the true foundation of all we know and perceive. Stick around till the end. I will share with you some tools I haven't used that will help you tremendously in this game of life. Discover a way to find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. I will share some tools to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. Science. You see, proceeds by a very fundamental assumption of the way things are, or must be, for this assumption, is that there exists out there a real objective reality. Now, this objective reality is something solid. It is made up of things that have attributes such as mass, electrical charge, momentum, angular momentum, spin, position in space, and continuous existence through time, expressed as inertia, energy, and going even deeper into the micro world, such attributes as strangeness, charm, and color. However, we are still left with a flock of mysteries, paradoxes, and puzzle pieces that simply do not fit. The universe does not seem to exist without a perceiver of that universe. There's too much quantum weirdness around, too many experiments showing that the objective world, one that is running forward in time like a clock, one that says action at a distance, particularly instantaneous action at a distance, is not possible. One that says a thing cannot be in two or more places at the same time is actually an illusion of our thinking. We have come to accept materialism dogmatically, despite its failure to account for the most familiar experiences of our daily lives. In short, we actually have an inconsistent worldview. There is a demand for a new paradigm, a unifying worldview that will integrate mind and spirit into science. The centerpiece of this new paradigm whoa, is the recognition that modern science validates an ancient idea, the idea that consciousness, not matter, is the ground of all being. 
Behold the following quantum properties. A quantum object, for example, an electron, can be at more than one place at the same time. The wave property. Number two, a quantum object cannot be said to manifest in ordinary space-time reality until we observe it as a particle. <coughs> the collapse of the wave. Number three, a quantum object ceases to exist here and simultaneously appears in existence over there. We cannot say it went through the intervening space, the quantum jump. And number four, a manifestation of one quantum object caused by our observation simultaneously influences its correlated twin object, no matter how far apart they are. Quantum action at a distance. The wave property, collapse of the wave, the quantum jump, and quantum action at a distance. Instead of posting that everything, including consciousness, is made of matter, this philosophy posts that everything, including matter, exists in and is manipulated from consciousness. Note that the philosophy does not say that matter is not real, but that the reality of matter is secondary to that of consciousness, which itself is the ground of all being, including matter. <coughs> Maslow neglected to take into account a, the consequences of unquestioned materialism, which is dominant in today's Western culture, most Westerners accept as scientific fact. The idea that we live in a materialist world, a world in which everything is made of matter, and where matter is the fundamental reality. In such a world, material needs proliferate resulting in desire not for spiritual progress, but for more, bigger, and better things. Bigger cars, bigger housing, the newest fashions, amazing forms of entertainment, and dazzling extravaganza of present and future technological goodies. If only matter is real, as materialism has taught us to believe, then material possessions are the only reasonable foundation for happiness and a good life. Of course, our religions, our spiritual teachers, and our artistic and literary traditions, tra traditions teach that such is not the case. On the contrary, they teach us that materialism leads, at best, to a sickening surfeit, and at worst, crime, disease, and other ills. There was once a Cossack who saw a rabbi walking through a town square nearly every day at about the same time. One day he asked curiously, where are you going, rabbi? The rabbi answered, I am not sure. You pass this way every day. At this time, surely you know where you are going. When the rabbi insisted that he did not know, the Cossack became irritated, then suspicious, and then finally took the rabbi to jail. Just as he was locking the cell, the rabbi faced him and said gently, You see, I didn't know. Before the Cossack interrupted him, the rabbi knew where he was going, but afterward he no longer knew. The interruption and we can call it a measurement, offered new possibilities. The world is not determined by initial conditions once and for all. Every event of a measurement is actually potentially creative and may open new possibilities. The antithesis of material realism is monistic idealism. In this philosophy, consciousness, not matter, is fundamental. Both the world of matter and the world of mental phenomena, such as thought, 
are determined by consciousness. In addition to the material and the mental spheres, which together form the imminent reality or world of manifestation, idealism posits a transcendent archetypal realm of ideas as the source of material and mental phenomena. Realism grew out of everyday perceptions. In our everyday experiences of the world, evidence abounds that things are material and separate from each other and from us, of course. Now, mental experiences do not fit neatly into such a formulation. Mental experiences such as thought do not seem to be material. So we have developed a dualistic philosophy that relegates mind and body to separate domains. Now, the integration of science and mysticism should not be too disconcerting. After all, they share an important similarity. Both grew out of empirical data, interpreted in the light of theoretical explanatory principles. There is no object in space-time without a conscious subject looking at it. Consciousness is the agency that actually collapses the wave of a quantum object which exists in potentia, making it an imminent particle in the world of manifestation. <coughs> what we see depends on theories we use to interpret our observations. How we reconstruct the past always depends on the theories we use. Thus arises the old philosophical puzzle about which is real. The theoretical image that we actually see, but only privately, or the empirical object that we do not seem to see directly, but about which we form a consensus. There are optical illusions. There are creative and mystical experiences of subjective images that do not necessarily correspond to anything in the immediate consensus reality. This is paradox of perception. We cannot seem to trust the authenticity of either our theoretical image or the consensus public empirical object. Philosophical isms are born out of such paradoxes. Historically, two schools of philosophy have debated what is really real. The idealist schools believe that the theoretical image is more real and that the so-called empirical reality is but ideas of consciousness. In contrast, realists hold that there must be real objects out there, objects about which we form a consensus, objects that are independent of the subject. We need to transcend the paradox. There are many ways of thinking about the mind-body problem, many ways to reach conclusions and many subtleties to be accounted for. As we embark on a tour of what I will call the University of Mind-Body Studies, I would like for you to bear these subtleties in mind. Imagine that all great mind-body thinkers are here and now at the University of Mind-Body Studies, where the transitional faculty from throughout history teaches these solutions, old and new, dualists and monists, to the mind-body problem. Now, before you enter the university, a word of caution. Retain your skepticism and always refer any philosophy to your own experience before you invest your allegiance. Dualism has difficulty in explaining mind-body interaction. Material monists negate free will and hold consciousness to be an epiphenomenon, merely the software clamoring of 
or biocomputer hardware. Even monistic idealists fall short of, because they too undermine the experience of the personal self, being too enamored by the whole. Can quantum mechanics break the deadlock on some of these questions? Why is personal selfhood a difficult problem for idealism? Well, because in idealism, consciousness is transcendent and unitive. One might well ask why, then, and how the sense of separateness actually arises. The only view of the brain-mind that is actually complete and consistent in its explanatory power is this. The brain-mind is an interactive system with both classical and quantum components. These components interact within a basic idealist framework in which consciousness is primary. The basis of understanding ourselves in the universe, the self of our self-reference, is due to a tangled hierarchy. But our consciousness is the consciousness of the being that is beyond the subject-object split. There is no other source of consciousness in the universe. The self of self-reference and the consciousness of the original consciousness together make what we call self-consciousness. In a sense, we are rediscovering an ancient truth. The brain-mind is a dual quantum system measuring apparatus. As such, it is unique. It is the place where the self-reference of the entire universe happens. The universe is self-aware through us. In us, the universe cuts itself into two, into subject and object. The self, the I, is not a thing, but a relationship between conscious experience and the immediate physical environment. In a conscious experience, the world appears to be divided into a subject and object or objects. Upon reflection in the mirror of memory, this division produces the dominant experience of the ego. <coughs> the salient experiences of the I are as follows. Number one, intentionality. Purposeful directional focusing towards an object including desire, judgment, and speculation. Number two, self-awareness, sense of self. Number three, reflectivity, awareness of being aware. Number four, ego experience, feeling that the self is a unique entity with a certain character, personality, and contingent personal history. Number five, attention. Number six, transpersonal self-experience, moments of revelation or insight as in the creative aha experience. Number seven, implicit experience of the self-experience in which there is division of the world into subject and object, but no explicit experience of I. Number eight, choice and free will, and number nine, experiences related to the unconscious. They are all intimately connected with one another. The universe is creative. You and I, in our creativity, are the living proof of it. In determinism, the world machine allows us to evolve only in its image as mind machines, but there really is no world machine. In our desire for harmony and for prediction and for control of our environment, we created the idea of the world machine and projected that deterministic image 
onto nature. Someday, said the Jesuit philosopher Taylor de Chardin, after we have mastered the winds, the waves, the tides, and gravity, we shall harness the energy of love. Then, for the second time in history of the world, man will have discovered fire. And there you have it, the self-aware universe, how consciousness creates the material world. Please do help out. It is easy. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. If you have enjoyed it, give it a like. That helps the algorithm, that helps the channel, that helps you, that helps everyone who wants to see this information. Help out. Share it too and spread the word. Share this information. Leave a comment and share your thoughts. Start a conversation. Start a conversation with me. Start a conversation with each other. Let's talk about this amazing topic. What do you think? Subscribe to my channel. Stay up to date. You know how to do that. The link to this book is in the description below. So buy it and read and never stop learning, especially learning about yourself and nature. So gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management even further, then do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. The links are in the description below. Thank you. Love and respect.